Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here on site uh, for this important event. Uh, fabulous to have you all with us here in such a great setting. We're at the IAET, the Institution of Engineering and Technology. What a fitting uh, scene for today's event. Uh, equally, a warm welcome to everybody joining us on the live stream. More than 3,000 people have signed up to join us online today. Uh, great to also have you with us. Now, uh, I'm Anna Moschner, I am the Communications and Marketing Director of DNV Maritime. It's my great pleasure to be your host for this coming hour or so. We really try to manage and stick on time, even though we have a lot of important uh, ground to cover, of course. So let's see how we get through. We are here today, as you all know, to launch the Maritime Forecast 2050 report, the 2023 edition. It's already the seventh edition of our flagship report that we publish on an annual basis. It's part of the bigger series of energy transition outlook reports that we publish at DNV. And it's been highly anticipated also this year. And I can promise you some interesting findings that we're really keen to take you through. We're doing it, as I said, live from London, live from London International Shipping Week, where the world of shipping is coming together, hopping all over the city for a couple of days. Uh, uh, but really, it doesn't matter where you are in the world of shipping right now. We're all in this together. We're all together at a crucial point in time of the maritime energy transition, uh, because the decisions that we take today will really significantly impact the way that we manage uh, the energy transition moving forward. Now, let's explore today uh, the journey towards a sustainable future. This is really the decisive decade for shipping, and only together can we set the right course. How? That's the big question, isn't it? How are we going to manage? How are we going to tackle this big, big challenge? Well, the maritime forecast may not hold all the answers, but if anything, we're hoping that it will enable you to take well-informed, to take better informed and science-based decisions, because if anything, that is the ambition we have for the maritime forecast to really assess how shipping can play its part uh, for a carbon neutral tomorrow. Now, the maritime forecast is not just addressing the hurdles. And yes, the hurdles need to be addressed and they need to be talked about and they will be talked about also today. But more importantly, we're really looking into innovative solutions and we're looking into alternative pathways. So this year, what you can expect from the report, if you haven't taken a sneak preview yet, uh, we're looking more into energy efficiency measures. We're also looking into cutting-edge technologies like carbon capture, like nuclear propulsion. And uh, what we're trying to do is uh, to really give a comprehensive roadmap for the industry. We highlight the need for collaboration. We highlight the need for flexibility. We also highlight the need for new contractual arrangements uh, that will be needed to share the costs on this big transformative journey. So a lot of good content in the report, and it will be very tough to address it all within just one hour. And I'm very happy to not be here all by myself to help you navigate the report's findings. We've put together a stellar lineup, a true dream team of DNV experts and industry leaders that will uh, put things into perspective. So in a minute, we'll begin with the CEO of DNV Maritime, Knut Erbeck Nielsen. We'll get to open the floor with a short keynote. He will be followed by Eirek Övrim, who is the lead author of this year's report, and he will take you through some of the key findings, and he will also talk a little bit about the implications for the industry. Afterwards, Knut will return on stage with a highly distinguished panel, and you can look forward to a lively debate addressing everything from the changing regula regulatory landscape, certainly the impact of the MEPC 80 decisions. We're going to address alternative strategies, the importance and the role ship finance has to play in the transition, and if anything, we will also come back to the important need of cross-sector and cross-industry collaboration. So truly the highlight 
of today's event and some really big names on the list for that panel representing Cargill, C-SPAN, Rio Tinto, Société Générale and Borealis Maritime. So stay tuned for that one. But before we dive into these discussions and I'll leave the stage to Knut, uh, we would like to warm you up a little bit for this very hot topic. Uh, let's set the scene with a short video. In the quest for a sustainable future, the maritime industry finds itself at a defining moment. The 2020s has emerged as the decisive decade for the decarbonization of shipping. The action we take now will determine our future success. Together, we must create sound and sustainable decarbonization strategies that consider all available options and technologies. A fast-evolving greenhouse gas regulatory framework is already taking shape. It brings about accelerated cost pressures on ship owners, reinforcing the importance of short-term energy-saving strategies. While the new regulatory initiatives are bound to speed up the production and use of sustainable fuels, infrastructure development is still in the early stages. This year's maritime forecast to 2050 dives into different options that can propel maritime decarbonization forward. We analyze how new regulations will shape the future fuel market and calculate future fuel demand. We explore selected technologies that can enhance energy efficiency right now. We investigate technologies that can help alleviate future demands for carbon-neutral fuels. And we outline a three-step approach to creating green shipping corridors, facilitating the adoption of carbon-neutral fuels by addressing barriers on a manageable scale. The possible routes to decarbonization are multiplying and ship owners should consider all available options when they map out their own optimal journey. The 2020s is a decisive decade for all of us. The quality and effectiveness of the plans we put in place today will dictate how successful we will be in reaching our decarbonization goals tomorrow. Dive into the maritime forecast to 2050 and embark on a voyage towards a sustainable future. At DNV, we help you turn uncertainty into confidence. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Yes, I would like to start with uh, a great and a big thank you to all of you for turning up today and also for all of you listening in on the live stream. Uh, it's truly a very interesting decade that we have ahead of us and, and we call it the decisive decade. I would also like to make an apology to my scriptwriters for not exactly bringing my manuscript on stage so I will freestyle a little bit, and if I'm politically incorrect, um, I hope you will forgive me. Um, so, the clock is ticking, we all know that, and with the actions of the governments at the IMO this July, we all know that we have accelerated the ambition level tremendously. And although this report says maritime forecast towards 2050, I would like to maybe focus more on 2030. So the ambition level for 2030, ladies and gentlemen, is to reduce by 20%. That might not seem that ambitious, but I can assure you that is very ambitious. I would say it's bordering on the unrealistic. And I will give you the rationale behind that. So we all know that we need to decarbonize. That's not the question. The question is really how can we do that with such a limited time ahead of us until 2030? 
And uh, if we look to fuel supply, and Eirik Overham of, a, of a, say, brain behind the forecast have done that quite scientifically, very fitting for the Kelvin lecture hall that we are in today. And um, he has assigned probabilities to all the different spots, places where the better fuels can be produced. And um, I'm afraid to say, for many of these, investment decisions have not been taken yet. And um, if we are to reach 20% reduction by 2030, shipping will need between 30 to 40% of the total global supply of green fuels. And um, that is quite a daunting task. And uh, many of these producers, they are not even thinking about providing their fuels to shipping. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that if we are to get off on a good trajectory towards 2050, we really have to think beyond fuels. And naturally, slow steaming makes sense, but we really need to take energy efficiency to the next level. And we have started with many different measures, and we read a lot about wind-assisted propulsion, air bubbles, and many other things, which will help us. But this will really need to be accelerated also for the existing fleet if we are to reach the ambition level. Now, if you ask me, what about the 70% reduction in 2040 or the net zero by or around 2050? I would say that's a little bit more open terrain because we have more time. There could be some new technologies in the outlook that Eric will present. We have looked into two specific technologies that might take this to the next level. It's the carbon capture and storage on board, which could help us. But there are, say, issues beyond the onboard technologies that are quite challenging as well. I'm thinking more on the systematic, systemic issues like where do you deposit this in ports and how do you get credits and how is it taken to save uh, storage places, which is quite a complicated issue to resolve in itself. Now, the other technology that we looked into is the nuclear technology. Obviously, with many advantages when it comes to reducing emissions, but also with some significant hurdles when it comes to public opinion and many other things. And that technology is really not mature in the sense that we can use it, say, especially for the modular uh, reactors. So the outlook is challenging, but I remain an optimist. And I think that we can manage, and shipping has really managed great challenges before, but it requires us all to collaborate. And I've talked about this before, but collaborate does not only mean collaborate within the shipping industry. It also means that we need to reach out to collaborate across sectors with those that produce the energy, with those that distribute the energy and the fuel, and not least with the ports that will provide them eventually to the vessels. And here also, public and private partnerships could make a really good contribution. And I stay optimistic on the so-called green shipping corridors. I think making a global problem into smaller pieces and agreeing between two ports or two different nations can really make a difference. And that's where we also see some early signs in, in some geographies where governments are really putting, you know, investments and initiatives in place to make that happen. And then I see a great 
future for a lot of the young people, the young talented individuals to come to our business because we have big issues to resolve and we know that the young talented boys and girls are really looking for those kind of challenges and make a difference uh, that really matters. And that's why I stay very optimistic, but I think in the short term we will be struggling and then hopefully we can unleash innovation and what I call the maritime renaissance so that we are able to reach the ambitions uh, that the governments have agreed for 2050. So with that, I would really not like to, to pre-empty more of the fine report that Eirik will present you now. But again, thank you very much for joining us today. And to all of you uh, watching the live stream, uh, I wish you a, a good session as well. And um, I think you have some good and interesting uh, topics to look forward to. So with that, thank you very much. And I will hand it back to Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Knut. Uh, very insightful remarks. Uh, collaboration is key, and I think you opened the speech with saying the, talk, uh, the clock is ticking. Uh, we'll come back to some of your key reflections, of course, during the panel. But uh, first things first, uh, we will now take you on a short journey through the report's key findings. We will also talk about the implications for the industry. So please now give a warm round of applause uh, for, I believe you called him, the brain behind the maritime forecast, the lead author of this year's edition, Eirik Ibrahim. Thank you. The maritime forecast to 2050 is one out of DNV's suite of energy transition outlook reports. This is the seventh edition, providing an updated outlook on regulations, drivers, technologies, and fuels for decarbonizing shipping. Last year, we concluded that the development of sustainable fuel supply chains must accelerate for us to achieve the transition. With that in mind, this year we delve deeper into the production of carbon neutral fuels and seeing challenges ahead, we look at technologies that can reduce the need for carbon neutral fuels for ships. Regulations, technologies and fuel production are developing with a large impact on shipping's future. In this year's report, we explore the new IMO goals and regulations for ship emissions we present analysis from a thorough mapping of existing and planned production of carbon neutral fuels and compare that against shipping's projected demand. To further assess fuel production and real decarbonization, we look at well to wake emissions of future marine fuels. It is necessary to consider all technologies for reducing energy consumption of ships and fuels for the decarbonization of ships. Therefore, we this year provide an in-depth look at onboard carbon capture and nuclear propulsion. The IMO has significantly strengthened its ambitions for the decarbonization of international shipping. New targets include a 20% reduction of total emissions by 2030, a 70% reduction by 2040, and with the ultimate goal of net zero emissions by close to 2050. The new total emission reduction criteria are based on well to wake emissions, not only tank to wake. And this will be regulated in the coming IMO fuel standard. New regulations are expected to enter into force around mid 2027. And in addition, EU sets the first ever international CO2 price for shipping, while IMO indicates a similar mechanism might come. The strong goals and expected regulations have already had an impact on fuel technology choices of the industry. While only 6.5% of ships in operation can operate on alternative fuels, 51% of the order book can. 
And the rapid change is seen when compared with last year's numbers of 5.5% of ships in operation and 33% in the order book. Keeping in mind that these ships operate today on fossil fuels. There's a rapid growth in the number of ships that can use LNG, LPG or methanol as fuel in dual fuel engines. And they will be required to have a large scale training of seafarers, no matter which technologies and fuels are the winners. Reducing the energy consumption of ships is critical to meeting the emission reduction goals, as carbon neutral fuels are not only expensive, but also come with emissions and environmental impact from their production on land. In our simulated simulation of the decarbonization of shipping, energy efficiency measures account for a third of emission reductions by 2050. There's a range of measures that can either reduce energy consumption or reduce emissions related to energy use. And saving energy will be valuable no matter which carbon neutral fuel you intend to use as they're all projected to come with higher costs than today's fossil fuels. In addition, there might be shortages of carbon neutral fuels. In this year's report, we discussed the status of six technologies, wind assisted propulsion, air lubrication, and solid oxide fuel cells as three technologies to reduce energy consumption. And we look at three fuel technologies, liquid hydrogen, onboard carbon capture, and nuclear. Several technologies need development, demonstration of performance, and commercialization in the coming years for shipping to achieve its emission reduction goals. Today, shipping consumes about 280 million ton oil equivalent of fuel annually, almost all fossil fuels. Here you can see the results of a comprehensive mapping of existing and planned projects for the production of carbon neutral versions of fuel oil, methane, methanol, ammonia and hydrogen. These products can be used as carbon neutral fuels for ships, but they can also be used as fuel for other sectors or for other industrial purposes. As examples, the hydrogen derivative ammonia is used in fertilizer production and methanol in the chemical industry. Therefore, we do not focus only on projects aiming to provide fuel for ships, but we look at all projects that will produce a product that can be used as carbon neutral fuel for ships. More than 2,200 projects are mapped and populated into our database. And we have both existing and planned production at different stages of development. From just being announced to having done a final investment decision to being in operation. And to estimate the total amounts of carbon neutral fuels that can be supplied, we assign each of these projects a likelihood of being completed. And we have two sets of likelihoods for a high and a low total estimate, with each project being assigned a likelihood according to where it is in its development stage. Looking towards 2030, this figure shows our high and low estimates for all carbon neutral alternatives across all industries that could be used as carbon neutral fuels for ships, compared with the estimated demand from shipping or carbon neutral fuels. 30 to 40 percent of global cross-sector carbon neutral fuel supply will be needed for shipping to achieve its estimated demand of 17 million ton oil equivalent of carbon neutral fuel by 2030 from meeting IMO's emissions. In comparison, Shipping consumes about 3% of the world's energy. To avoid pushing shipping's emissions of greenhouse gases to other sectors, 
a full life cycle approach, also known as well-to-wake perspective, will be implemented by the EU and IMO. As fuels are produced on land, there will be emissions both before the ship and from the ship. And this will have a major impact on how fuel producers and the shipping industry approach different fuels. And the Maritime Forecast 2050 provides an overview of this. Fuel production standards and certification of fuels will be crucial to meeting well-to-wake standards. And coming regulations are expected to include penalties for not meeting well-to-wake standards. With the EU and IMO planning to adopt regulations in 2025 and 2027, respectively. On the left-hand side here, we see a possible future with no fuel production standards or ship regulations on well-to-wake emissions, where seemingly carbon-neutral fuels can have similar well-to-wake emissions as fossil fuels. For example, biofuels made from agricultural main products or electrofuels made from grid electricity made from large parts of fossil fuels. In this hypothetical example, emissions are moved from the ship to the production of its fuel on land. The Fuel EU Maritime, and now the coming IMO's fuel standard, will implement rules that will ensure that using fuels to reduce emissions from shipping will result in actual reduced global warming. Hopefully resulting in the scenario for global well-to-wake emissions of shipping seen on the right-hand side. We have performed a case study of onboard carbon capture and nuclear propulsion for a 15,000 TEU container vessel sailing between the Far East and Europe. Combusting fuels containing carbon, such as fuel oil, LNG, LPG or methanol, will produce CO2 that today is emitted to the atmosphere. After reducing energy consumption, the proposed solutions fall into three categories. Using fuels without carbon, producing fuels using sustainable carbon, or capturing CO2 from combustion. Biofuels, electrofuels and blue fuels are all highly sought after by other industries. For example, biofuels in aviation, renewable electricity for the grid, methanol, ammonia and hydrogen for industrial use. Using onboard carbon capture or nuclear propulsion, ship owners, ship owners can avoid the competition for sustainable biomass and renewable electricity. Carbon capture for land-based industries is mature and storage is being built out with projections for annual global CO2 storage capacity in 2050 being multiples of shipping's total emissions today. The infrastructure for receiving and sequestering marine CO2 will need to be built out. Storing CO2 on board requires space, yet we find that it's technically feasible for our case study vessel. Capturing 70% of CO2, storing it in 4,000 cubic meters of tanks, and offloading CO2 four times per round trip. With similar use of extra volume as for using LNG as fuel, which will require 12,000 cubic meters of LNG tanks. The technology is being developed with research projects underway and a full scale, high capture rate installation to be tested on the ship seen on top here in 2024. The case study ship is operating from 2030 to 2060 with zero carbon intensity from 2050. The baseline to compare against is found using four technologies, where each is blending in the appropriate amount of carbon neutral fuels to meet emission regulations, over five price scenarios, 
yielding 20 different lines for annual costs, hidden within this gray band on the figure. Capturing CO2 on a ship requires extra energy use, called a fuel penalty, while offloading CO2, having it transported away and sequestered, will come at a cost. We construct a low-cost CCS scenario where we consume 15% extra fuel to capture 70% of the CO2, and we pay $40 per ton of CO2 offloaded. And we construct a high-cost CCS scenario with 30% fuel penalty and $80 per ton deposit cost. The case study shows that onboard carbon capture can compete with other proposed decarbonization solutions. Approximately 700 nuclear reactors have been used on ships and submarines since the first nuclear-powered vessel, the American submarine Nautilus, was introduced in 1955. Today, 160 vessels with 200 nuclear reactors are in operation. The nuclear industry is developing small modular reactors and looking at dimensions and weights of these reactors and auxiliary equipment, we find that it's technically feasible for our case study vessel. With decarbonization, marine industry reactors are looking at using nuclear reactors on merchant vessels and companies are planning pilots for the early 30s. While recognizing that there are barriers to its universal uh, application, such as development of new reactors suitable for a commercial environment, using different fuels than navies, port access, regulations, and public perception. For the nuclear-powered ship, we assume leasing of the reactor at a fixed annual cost, with a high and low capex based on historical prices for land-based nuclear power. The leasing cost is based on an annuity loan over the lifetime of the ship at 8% interest, yielding annual costs of the two scenarios as seen on the figure. The case study shows that nuclear propulsion can compete with other decarbonization solutions, especially in a net zero regulatory regime, both for onboard carbon capture and nuclear propulsion for merchant vessels. The technology needs development and maturation. Our key findings are that strengthened IMO ambitions and the first CO2 price for shipping in the EU set shipping's decarbonization pathway. By 2030, this will require 30 to 40 percent of global cross-sector carbon neutral fuel supply. Today, half the ordered tonnage can use LNG, LPG or methanol in dual fuel engines. But global produ fuel production standards are needed to meet IMO's net zero by close to 2050 goal. An onboard carbon capture and nuclear are technically and economically feasible options. The implications of this is that fuel producers must accelerate plans, but they need offtake commitments from fuel buyers. And reducing energy consumption is critical to lowering emissions and to be able to sustain the impact of increased energy costs. This fuel and technology shift will require large-scale training of seafarers, no matter which technologies or fuels are the winners. Going forward, further regulatory clarity and commercialization of new technologies is required. And the cost of decarbonization must be carried through the maritime value chain by green corridors or similar mechanisms. The 2020s is indeed proving to be the decisive, decisive decade for the decarbonization of shipping. Finally, our recommendations for ship owners are that they should reduce energy consumption now, consider 
all decarbonization options, focus on fuel flexibility, and consider long-term fuel strategies. Thank you. Uh, Eric, great job done at summarising uh, what is really a comprehensive piece of research so concisely. Well done. Thank you so much uh, for the time being. Of course, Eric will be around for all of those here in the room, at least, uh, uh, during the drinks reception later on, in case you have questions to him. But now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's move on to... Uh, the highlight of today's event. Um, uh, we have now the panel up on the agenda. So if I could kindly, yeah, you're already making your way up here, Knut, ask all the panelists to join us on stage. Knut will be the esteemed moderator of this panel session. And uh, while everybody else is getting settled in, let me make use of the one minute I have to uh, remind you all that, of course, the Maritime Forecast is available for download at maritime at dnv.com slash maritime forecast. That's the one to remember. And there, of course, you also find related article, links to related services, points of contact, and whatnot. That was my commercial break. And if you're ready, I'll leave the stage to you. Knut, please. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, yes, and thank you very much to Eirik. I thought that was a very well, a very good presentation, Eirik, of a very comprehensive report. Thank you very much. There's no warming up here, so I will quickly introduce the panelists and we'll get straight into the difficult questions. So, um, to my left, uh, Lor Baratkin, Head of uh, Commercial Operations at Rio Tinto. Welcome. Uh, Bing Chen, uh, President and CEO of Atlas Corporation and C-SPAN, where you're also the chairman. Uh, and then we have uh, Christoph uh, Topfer, you are the CEO of Borealis uh, Maritime, welcome. And uh, Jan Dillman, President uh, of Cargill Ocean Transport, but also Chair of the Global Maritime Forum, welcome. And last but not least, Paul Taylor, Global Head of Maritime Industries, Société Générale. And you're also the Vice Chair of the Poseidon Principles. So I don't want to read out the gentlemen's and the ladies' uh, CV because it, it will take too long time, but uh, I, I think you get the drift. It's uh, leading uh, stakeholders and players in our industry. So I said there's no warming up, so let's uh, get on with it. So this is a question for all the panelists, and maybe we could start with you, Laura, and then we just go down the line. And um, given the outcome of the MEPC 80 and the evolving regulations, the shipping industry faces ambitious greenhouse uh, targets, as we have heard. Uh, and as Eric also mentioned, the shipping's demand for carbon neutral fuels may uh, comprise 30 to 40 percent of the global supply. And the urgency of this decisive decade is apparent and, and setting aside the 250 goals, but looking more to 2030 and maybe also 2040, what concrete steps in your view are now necessary to achieve essential short to medium term progress, please? Thanks, Sir Agnut, and um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so you wonder eventually what uh, we're doing here as a mining and metal company. Actually, we're also uh, on the shipping space, you know, as uh, ship owners, but uh, cargo owners, uh, as you can imagine. And uh, definitely sharing part of the conclusion uh, and the recommendation, I will nuance that it's not just a, a ship owner uh, conversation and imperative, uh, but really the, the broader span of, uh, of the, uh, the industry that needs to take a uh, measure uh, today uh, for today and the future. Uh, so what we're seeing essentially from our end is the energy efficiencies. That's the first and foremost. Everything that we will not require is, uh, is um, basically uh, uh, the imperative for today. Uh, particularly when we look at uh, on the uh, energy saving devices, which are quite uh, not necessarily capital intensive with very short uh, return on investment. Uh, there are no excuses you know, for not implementing uh, uh, these solutions, uh, as well as basically optimization, which leads you know, to, in the end, uh, uh, s slow steaming, but as well you know, working with our customers to uh, see how we can increase the, the vessel uh, sizes and uh, can elaborate further you know, on what we, we're doing on, 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 on that space uh, with, uh, within uh, the, the, Rio, the Rio trades. Uh, the other part is uh, 
we are, we're seeing a huge scarcity of uh, fuels and future fuels uh, availability. Uh, we struggle to basically get this uh, this project uh, uh, off the uh, off the ground. Uh, so the uh, the imperative as well is to as we compete all with particularly the hydrogen molecule, uh, whether it's in the power generation, still decarbonization. Uh, as an r and producer, we, we see how our customers are struggling on the steel decarbonization and where hydrogen is very much required to change the technology there uh, and shipping for basically all the um, uh, uh, derivatives and, and, and uh, from, from hydrogen that uh, shipping, but also the other industries are requiring. Uh, we believe that the, the Fostering, you know, this uh, fuel production and the hydrogen production uh, needs, you know, basically carbon uh, pricing and carbon-based measure. So then, you know, there is the possibility for uh, not only passing on some of the cost where the willingness to pay is uh, zero, very close to zero, uh, and basically as well, you know, reassuring uh, investors as well to make sure that uh, uh, they can support the investments on the uh, development of these future fuels. Great insights, please, Spain. Thank you, Knut. Um, as the uh, owner-operator, we are firmly committed to the uh, decarbonization. Uh, you know, from our perspective, uh, our principle in terms of the short-term and medium term is uh, two things. One is the practicality, meaning that any, uh, any you know, initiatives that we make must have the immediate impact to the carbon reduction. And the other part is that we're making the investment consistently over the years. Um, you know, these are the two principles, and specifically for us that we have the four-pillar approach. The first is the uh, you know, continuous improvement, um, as, as actually I echo in what the canoe you talked about earlier. To achieve this uh, carbon reduction, we have to go way beyond just the fuel alone, because we have to address the current uh, you know, fleet. Today, if you're looking at the container space, you have uh, over 6,000 ships. Out of the 6,000 ships, I think if you think maybe 1,000 of them can be scrapped, but the other 5,000 ships that still have a good 10 or 15, 20 years of life to go, what we're going to do with those ships, which is why we're number one, our focus is the continuous improvement in terms of the operations, the design, and also the actual the modification of these ships so that they can have the maximum, mm. maximum loadability and uh, the minimal fuel consumption. So that's number one. Two is, is the transition path. As, you know, as we transition to the, to the clean fuel, um, I think the existing ships, the number one that we could do is, is that in addition to the new build that we have, which we have a significant program over the past years, that we have 70, uh, over 900,000 TUs of the new build. Uh, but in, the, in addition to that, uh, you know, we also focusing on the retrofit, the, the, the existing ship's conversion into the you know, alternative fuels, namely the um, ammonia, the methanol, and also uh, the, the, the LNG. So that's the transition, I think, in addition to looking at the new build, is how do we actually retrofit? Uh, recently, we actually led the initiative of uh, you know, retrofitting the S90. Uh, engines, and we are actively working with the engine makers, uh, both Man, Wasilla, and Winjindi, in looking at a broader range of retrofitting of these existing uh, vessels to the alternative fuels. So that's the second, uh, you know, part. The third part is, is leveraging the uh, fleet intelligence, which is leveraging on the you know, artificial intelligence the big data so that we'll be able to closely monitor the performance of the fleet. So therefore, that you can you know, maximize the efficiency once again. Yeah. And then uh, also through the, the designing of the new ships, um, you know, our team actually have the collaborations with the uh, Maersk McKinney Muller for Zero Carbon Shipping uh, you know, initiative that designed the first 15,000 uh, TEU ammonia, uh, you know, dual fuel ships. So these are the initiatives that we are taking uh, in leveraging on this, um, uh, you, you know, intelligence. And also the last part uh, is, is, you know, actually the most important part also is to uh, work in very closely with our liner customers. Because ultimately our liner customers that, that they have 
the intelligence they have the needs as to what are the uh, reduction initiatives during this uh, you know, long journey. Yeah, even though 2050 is not too far away, but if you're looking at where we are uh, to where we want to accomplish, it's still quite a long journey. So we're working very closely with them. And also we are working with all the stakeholders uh, in this industry, whether it's uh, fuel, produ fuel production, uh, the research, the development, so that we can find uh, the best market intelligence, uh, market application, so that we can really uh, contribute to the reduction. Thank you, Bing. Christoph, what's, what's your take on this? Yes, so we, we pre represent uh, more of a traditional owner, um, although we are not uh, really a traditional you know, owner like a, a Greek family office. Um, but uh, you know, we have uh, a slightly different approach around you know the long longevity of our assets that we that we sometimes have, and we also don't invest into new buildings. So our our take is very much you know how do we get to what you described the the goal of 2030. You know, it, it, you have to focus on what you can tackle right now. You know, alternative fuels, you know, obviously that's a topic, you know, there, there's more and more research being done. You know, uh, you can tell also on various panels today or, or yesterday, there's a lot of uncertainty. You know, the title here turned uncertainty into, uh, into confidence. At the moment, there's still a lot of uncertainty and different opinions around ammonia, methanol, hydrogen, etc. And nobody really knows. And there's a lot of, uh, lot of work being done. But uh, unless you're Cargo or, or Maersk who can secure your supply, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of uh, green uh, methanol um, or other alternative fuels, it's very difficult. Yes, you described it, you know, 30 to 40 percent of available uh, alternative fuels would be needed for shipping to achieve 20, uh, 30 goals. So it's realistically not achievable and um, we therefore have to look for other things. You know, it is very much uh, you know, uh, the retrofits uh, that, um, that uh, we are focused on as well. Um, it's amazing actually to some extent how some of the smaller owners really don't uh, yet invest into it because we, and, and uh, you know, with works of uh, classification societies have obviously identified a lot of low-hanging fruits, I would describe, where the payback uh, on your investments into retrofits is, is fairly fast. From next year onwards, we have a price for carbon on, on the vessels trading uh, within the EU or to the EU. And that obviously makes, again, retrofits even more uh, economical. Um, so there is a lot to be gained uh, in that area. And then also, if you otherwise, you, you have the way to wake, well to wake approach now on fuels, but you also, in the future, you will have a, call it the way, well to wake approach for, for ships, um, you know, meaning the construction of the vessel and the scrapping of the vessel. And you will also potentially have to uh, prolong the life of a vessel if you achieve with retrofits, you know, some, some good savings. You can also decarbonize um, the life of a vessel if you potentially extend it. Um, one big question that, uh, that uh, you know, we have um, and that the industry should have is where the capital is coming from. You know, we are an owner who is uh, working a lot with institutional capital. And we definitely have seen uh, a significant divergence of, of capital away from shipping. And this is nothing to do just with, you know, where are the opportunities in shipping, maybe there are fewer runs right now, but also that for a lot of uh, capital providers, if they have to take scope three um, emissions into their, you know, um, into the reporting, you know, shipping becomes a very inattractive asset class. I had lunch today with a, with a banker and he said, we would love to lend to shipping, but we are already at the, the top end of our decarbonization goals. If we, invest, if we lend to shipping, we're going to achieve it, uh, it, you know, exceed it. And so, you know, capital is struggling to, um, to con continue investing into shipping on the debt side as well on the equity side. And at the same time, we have a mounting task ahead of us to try to you know, rebuild the fleet over the next you know, 10 or 15 years with uh, new technology, new propulsion systems, you know, eventually potentially nuclear and other things. Um, so a lot of challenges, but you know, to achieve the, the immediate goals, um, I think is retrofits, green corridors as well. Um, you have around 7% uh, of, uh, of the vessels on the water produce 50% of emissions. Uh, so you have, if you tackle the bigger vessels first, and you can achieve this with green corridors, you already have also a much bigger your bang, for, bang for the buck, um, where, where your reduction in emissions from shipping, if you tackle the large vessels, you're achieving much more than trying to capture everyone in, in, in the game. Thank you, Christoph. We might come back to that question on, on the bank here in, in a few moments, uh, since we have Paul on the panel. But first, Jan, um, uh, Cargill can access green fuels, we heard. 
Yeah, and also I, I think coming back to your initial question, I, I think in the end of the day, if we want to accelerate the transition, what we need to do is, is make it as cheap as possible. And I think you've got a couple of levers here, and, and one is um, the regulator, and I'll come back to that. I think the other one is, is very much uh, focused on the availability of the fuels, and we saw that that's potentially a problem. Uh, and the third one is to really make sure that you have really efficient supply chains, and I think that's bigger than, than just the asset. So then the question is, what do we do as a company in the, those areas, right? And I think on the regulatory side, we're very much an advocate for a price on carbon to somehow bridge that gap between the old fuels and the new fuels, the low carbon fuels, the zero carbon fuels. Um, and it's great that we've seen the MAPC 80, but it needs to result in some real regulation now. And that's something that we really will be pushing for. And if you look at the fuel availability, it's, I, I think sometimes in the industry is looking too much and it says the fuel supply should be doing this. But in the end of the day, we also have a responsibility to give the demand signals. And one of the reasons why we, we committed to the five methanol cancer maxes was to do exactly that and just to really show that there's demand for this. And, and that's the role that we want to play. And in the last one, the supply chain optimization, I think there's an awful lot to be done. And it's not just the asset, as I said, uh, although there's a lot to be done there. Uh, talk about paint ducts. Uh, you saw that we put the first uh, wind wing vessel on, on, on the water just as recently. Uh, but it's also just trying to really get waste out of the supply chain. We still have ships waiting left, right and center. We can still scale up. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do. And, and I think it's more than the asset. And that also means what was said earlier, it's just not shipping on its own. It's the whole supply chain needs to tackle that. And I think that's what we're trying to, to focus on being uh, a, well, a participant in many parts of the supply chain. Great, thanks. Paul, is there any capital left for shipping? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'll come on to that in a second. Yeah, I will answer the, the, that, that point. But um, maybe I can answer the, the initial question please. in a little bit of a different way. Um, you know, the clock is ticking in 2023, so this decade is already it's ticking away. Um, and I really think um, what, what we need is um, any, any way of increasing transparency and accountability and commitment. Um, there, there is still a lack of transparency in this industry. And um, I, really, I really think the IMO have missed a trick by, they've really kicked the can down the road by um, putting in place this 2026 date as the date when there'll be the next review. And um, regulation is something which, if we had more certainty and it was more concise, clear, um, that would help this industry um, decarbonize. And by effectively saying no one's going to know uh, how the CII is going to work until 2026 and there will be no penalties, um, is slowing down decarbonization. I think that's a, that's, um, um, a, a real shame because having um, compulsory transparency in reporting emissions would wake everybody up big time. So and on the banking side, it's the same. You know, um, 30 banks now are members of the Poseidon Principles, um, which is where banks are committing to um, publicly reporting their, their emissions on their loan portfolios. That's going to increase in terms of ambition in, in the coming weeks, um, certainly in line with the new post MEPC 80 um, ambition, which is good news, but it's still not 1.5. But what that is going to do is going to drive capital towards the, the greener projects and not just the greener assets, but the, the, those ship owners who commit, those who actually have a strategy towards, um, towards 2050 and the pathway to it. So coming on to that um, second question, um, I, I totally understand that the point that that banker made, and it's probably, he's probably very frustrated in making the point, but it's all very well aligning with the Poseidon principles um, in, in one respect, but banks have, most banks have wider commitments to 1.5. So if shipping can't align, that capital that will go to shipping will go to another industry. So we have no option other than to align ourselves. So when, a, when capital is not made available for a, a particular client or a particular project, you know, it's, it's going somewhere else, and that's, that's a real frustration. So the only way that um, we can make sure that th this capital goes to shipping is to come up with, with the right projects, but also by, by rating, by giving an ESG rating to all our clients so that the capital is going to the right clients who have got the right commitments. Hmm. 
Great. Yes, please. Yeah, I'd like to, to, to also uh, complement in a bit um, from, from that perspective. I think uh, definitely, as we <coughs> mentioned earlier, you know, we're all competing for, for, for hydrogen, essentially. And I think, you know, in, in terms of uh, the support of the, uh, the banking industry, this is very critical uh, to support the financing, particularly on, on the fuel uh, uh, supplies, you know, for, for, for shipping to, uh, to decarbonize. But let's be honest, you know, it will be very difficult, you know, for us to, to win the fight. So first is uh, how, you know, we are looking at uh, uh, basically making sure that the investments are not basically just on the projects as basically developed or at the pilot stage, but really upfront on the pre-seed seed, uh, stages as well, because we need also uh, for, for these projects, you know, to have access to uh, uh, cheap capital uh, in order, you know, to, uh, to see uh, uh, life. But as well, are there ways to combine? Because uh, we need also this hydrogen or, or ammonia or methanol uh, production for other sectors. So are, are we able you know, to basically finance uh, projects in the same areas and basically piggyback, you know, uh, which is something that internally at Rio we, we are looking at in terms of I know shipping will not win in Rio Tinto. So how can I piggyback, you know, on the power generation with ammonia, uh, with my colleagues that uh, that needs that to so basically expand a little bit the capex, and then uh, in the end, you know, minimize the cost uh, that uh, that we can have. So we could, you know, take that example eventually and see, you know, uh, within the the banking uh, assessment of the project, are there basically synergies uh, that we can find, you know, where we could allocate, you know, some capital uh, to shipping because shipping itself will not win. Great insights. No, I was just going to say, I, I completely agree. You know, one, one of the things that we're actually doing is, is exactly that. We, we are now looking further up the, um, the value chain, uh, introducing our, our ship owning clients to, to, um, into ammonia projects, into methanol projects, so actually that they can secure offtake mm. um, and trying to make that you know, financeable, ideally, but even if it's, uh, it's an advisory uh, mandate for us rather than financing, that's a good thing, but to actually partner our clients in this type of project is um, a, a very, very important business for us. Great. I want to come back to some of the, what makes, a, say, a green project in terms of a ship. And uh, we agree that, uh, you know, energy emission reduction is, is important, um, energy saving is important. Um, and uh, we've seen many examples lately about wind-assisted propulsions, there's, there's fuel cells, there's onboard carbon capture that, uh, 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 that Eric talked about, and even nuclear technologies that are being developed. Now, if I could turn to you first being, and then to Christo. So how do you assess the relevance uh, of these also with the timeline in mind, these different energy saving technologies? I think this is very practical and the relevance to what we're doing on the, you know, based on whatever the technology is available today. I think if you're looking at the, the, the there's many uh, things that in addition, in addition to this, for example, AMP, uh, you know, wind, solar, uh, carbon capture. Uh, these other things today are, uh, you know, in 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 a real practical sense that could be applied to what our existing fleet and in reducing the uh, carbon, uh, you know, footprints. So from our perspective, we actually take this as a normal course of business, working with our customer in actually implementing them uh, in the existing fleet based on our customers' uh, needs, and we're actually doing that. Hmm. Great. Christoph, anything to add to that? <laughs> yes, I think it, uh, you know, in, the, in the shorter term, uh, carbon capture, I mean, shorter term is uh, still the next 10 years or so. Um, you know, maybe carbon capture has, has a great, great uh, you know, um, a future on, on, on ships and also achieving something uh, faster than, than the nuclear option. I think uh, on the nuclear side, you know, that is when it comes, if it comes, it looks like it, it, there's a good chance that it will come. You know, we're still talking 15 to 20 years from now. So it's a long, long lead way until we have nuclear propulsions. Um, but realistically, the more you look into the nuclear option, um, you, you actually realize how attractive you know, nuclear energy is um, and how the new technologies you know, are really able to be applicable um, as, as, a, as a power source for, for vessels. Now, in the, in the 
next 10 years, probably nuclear can, can play a role um, on, on the floating uh, nuclear production facilities where you produce potentially you know, green fuels, uh, green hydrogen or, or other things. I think in general, nuclear is an option that needs to be uh, you know, uh, utilized in order to uh, produce green alternative fuels. Um, otherwise, it, it's very difficult to, to potentially project the amounts of green fuels being produced that, that are required. So um, I think the combination of carbon capture um, over the next 10 years um, has, has great promises. Your study has shown that it can actually be, even in a high case, can be attractive. So it has a low case and a high case, and, and the low case is a no-brainer almost. You know, the high case is even that is, is, is very much in the, in the middle of the field. So I think that that, that was a very strong uh, outcome uh, in regards to investment into, into um, those technologies. Great. Paul, you did cover some of the say, questions around financing just a moment ago, but uh, would any of these technologies that we talk about here, the wind assisted propulsion, fuel cells, etc., will they qualify for being green in the way of, of, of financing in, in your, your world? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, getting a green certification in, in shipping has proved not, not easy. So, so far, and one of the reasons why there's not many green and blue bonds in the market. Um, <clears throat> but, um, and, and what you have to have if you're going to be in these, this, this market is um, very, very in-depth knowledge of, of these markets. Um, and fortunately, I think the banks that are, are, are getting into these new, new technologies re really have very strong um, sort of knowledge. So the answer to your question is, is yes, uh, and we're spending a significant time um, working with um, some of the emerging leaders on wind technology, on, on onboard carbon capture. We are um, heavily involved in um, CO2 shipping. Um, we're, we're, we're advising a UK company at the moment on that. Um, and with a view to hopefully you know, also financing these, these projects when, when they come around, that's, that's a big question. And I'd, I would think that they would get a green certification, yes. Mm, great stuff, thank you. Um, we talked about in the report about the green shipping corridors and, and both Lor and Jan, you've been involved directly. So I would like to ask you, where are we going with these? Are they really taking off and, and what's your experience and, and how do you see them going forward, please? Maybe Lor, if you would kick us off. Yeah, I'll give a, a start. And um, um, so assuming everybody's familiar, you know, with the principle of, uh, of the green corridors, which basically uh, um, are meant to uh, focus, you know, the attention given, you know, the scale of, of the trades that they, they, they represent, but in, and then as such, you know, uh, an opportunity to make a difference on the emission point of view. So we've been participating to uh, the R&R green corridor between Western Australia uh, and then Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, I, will, I will say, you know, that from that perspective, we had basically ship owners and, and charters uh, working with us, uh, but rapidly, you know, we brought uh, to the table of, uh, of discussions uh, the fuel producers. Uh, so that's essentially on an ammonia basis uh, that we were looking at, but not exclusively, but we focused our attention on, the, on an ammonia uh, point of view. So rapidly we brought uh, uh, fuel producers uh, on board, as well as uh, uh, the PPA, the uh, Pilbara Port Authority, uh, on the infrastructure point of view. Uh, but we were missing, you know, essentially uh, one, I would say, an elephant in the room, uh, which is basically the legislature. Uh, because as much as we can basically as well uh, uh, agree that uh, we need to act now, uh, there is still, you know, the perspective of uh, how we're going to uh, implement that, uh, given uh, on the R&R point of view, there is no willingness to pay from the customers. So not all the corridors are in the same dynamic. There is uh, other statements which explains why the container liners and rapidly, you know, the car carriers uh, will uh, implement or are implementing uh, dual fuel solutions and so on, and, and basically uh, uh, hunting for, for, for the, uh, the, the green fuels. Uh, on the bulk side, uh, which I represent our customers, uh, have an imperative to decarbonize uh, steel making or aluminium making. Uh, so if you look at Rio Tinto, for example, in terms of uh, scope uh, uh, three uh, uh, emission, it's, uh, it's about uh, 600 million tons of, uh, of CO2. And, and that's uh, basically essentially from, from the steel industry. So when we ask, uh, you know, our shipping emission, including the scope three, is about a set seven million tons. So quite a different ratio as, uh, as we, we, we know. So that 
integrator is also a takeaway uh, from uh, the, the corridors. We need to identify, you know, who will be the integrator, which, uh, and we believe, you know, that the governments have a key role to play, both on the Australian basis, but also on the on the other leg, uh, Southeast uh, Asia, and on the Namonia basis. So definitely, as you know, uh, Japan is quite keen uh, to progress the, the solution from that perspective, are enabling, you know, uh, with um, basically a, uh, legislation, whether it's uh, incentive, whether it's uh, a carbon price or on a, on a, on a local basis, uh, the opportunity to well spread the cost, and that's essentially uh, one of the key uh, uh, takeaway, and which is basically the second phase that uh, we will now uh, uh, look at, which is uh, the integration to make it uh, happen, uh, and uh, and also you know looking at uh, what are the uh, pricing you know uh, mechanism of the agreements uh, mechanism that. Uh, uh, will make it successful. Thank you very much. Uh, Jan, what's your views? On yeah, this? no, I, I think the green corridors are extremely important because we cannot decarbonize this industry in a one pace. You need to start somewhere, make it specific, make it concrete. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of it. I do have to say I'm getting a bit worried of somehow a bit of an inflation around the world of green corridors because every desktop research seems to be called or claimed to be a green corridor nowadays. and. And that's not really what we want to do. Um, so we're focusing on two things at the moment. One is um, facilitating the low carbon fuels. Uh, we have quite an extensive biofuel program. And I can attest what Lore says, that the car carriers, container lines are clearly the ones swooping up that supply very, very quickly. Uh, so that's a way that we facilitate in Singapore and, and Amsterdam, Rotterdam. And the other one is we're really concrete now. We, we have these five methanol ships where we want to create a green corridor. And what you're finding, if you really go from the desktop into the real world, is you start seeing all the other issues, and it's not just around technical feasibility or, or the fuels available. It's also, are you going to be able to tap into a segment that can actually afford that premium? And can you actually run these ships in a way that you can actually still keep the logistics in place what you normally have? And, and then very quickly, you come into a conclusion that within these green corridors, you probably need to have a book and claim kind of system again. And so as you go, you start seeing that this is actually quite complex and it's not just like, oh, there's a fuel supply there, oh, there's a willing government here, so green corridor, we are, we are there. There's a lot of hard work to be done to really get it over the line. A lot of hard work to be done. That's, that's a good uh, comment. Um, I want to sort of round off where we started and, and come back to the starting point. And maybe if you could share with the audience um, whether you're optimistic or, or not when it comes to the ambition level of the IMO looking towards being net zero by or around 2050. So maybe if we could start with you, Paul, and then we could just come down uh, towards me on, on that, please. Sure. Um, I think many people were quite surprised in a, in a positive way about what the IMO came up with after MEPC 80. Um, we probably weren't expecting as much ambition as we saw. Even some of the more, um, uh, sort of more um, militant academics were surprised, I think, by, by um, what the IMO came up with. But then again, it's still not 1.5. So we mustn't lose sight of the fact that it still falls short of where a lot of the stakeholders want to be. With, with their own targets and their commitments. So um, the IMO has to keep, not, not give itself a big tick in the box, but keep look at, looking at um, um, setting, setting new standards for the industry. So um, we should be pleased, but you know, they, they need to a bit, do a bit better. But you know, in the meantime, there's going to be an awful lot of twists and turns in, in the road um, between now and 2050. I'm a bit concerned about um, 2030. Um, we're going to be, I think, off, off the mark. Uh, at that first pathway point, uh, but we have to keep financing the transition, um, keep financing those fuels like LNG, which will become bio and synthetic in due course, believe in our clients who are committed, and then, you know, hopefully with the help of some increased regulation of the IMO, um, we'll, we'll catch up. And I'm still quite confident that we'll get there for net zero in 2050, but, you know, maybe a little bit less on 1.5. <laughs> Great, thank you. Well, yeah. I, I would align quite a bit with Paul. I, I think one of the big things that also came out of MAPC 80, which isn't talked a lot about, is that we finally aligned the life cycle emissions with the rest of the world, right? Because shipping was this, this one thing that just wanted to look at operational emissions. And, and, and now we're at least we're talking the same language in, in the whole supply chain. So I think that's a huge win as well. I, I do think decarbonizing is not going to be a, a straight line. Uh, not all sectors will go at the same pace. So I think we need to be smart 
on prioritizing the sectors where we can actually speed up. I fully agree with Paul, we need a regulator now to step in because we can't on leaning on the private sector, which has been the case to now. At some point, you can only lead so much, you can only front run so much. So it's really time for the regulator to step up. Um, and I think I, we are going to get there by 2050. I think the 2030, I'm a, a little bit in doubt as well. But to be honest, I'm not sure if that's something that we need to really beat ourselves up too much about. As long as we get to that 2050 and we get that bend of the curve, and that's, if that's in 2031, 2032, I, I don't think that's the real issue that we should get hung up on. Mm. Thank you. Christoph? Um, yeah, to your question, uh, am I an optimist or are we optimistic? Uh, I'm an optimist. Uh, if you're a ship owner, you have to be an optimist. Generally. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that we all realize that 2030 is, is tough. Um, uh, and you described it um, in, in, your, in your introduction remarks as well, that you know, 2050, we have a lot of time. Uh, humankind is, or human nature is, is very, very in innovative. And um, you know, uh, the doomsday scenarios that some, some protesters sometimes you know, put out uh, you know, uh, you know, we don't. Uh, I don't follow, but uh, obviously, you know, we all have realized also with a very hot summer. I mean, I had some people saying hmm, maybe climate change is actually real, uh, and and uh, you know, I think 2030 is tough, uh, but 2050, I'm quite optimistic. Uh, we're going to find technologies um, that that are going to work. That's very good to hear. Bing, boss of year. Yeah, we, we believe that 2050 the direction definitely is the right uh, direction to go. Um, however, the, the journey will be not straight line. Um, from a business perspective, I think in, independent of this uh, IMO uh, am, ambition, I think as a business, you have the social and corporate responsibility. Uh, and from a business perspective, you always want to provide the best solution uh, to, the, to, to your customer, to the industry. So, you know, reducing the carbon emission, improve the efficiency, uh, and, and the consumption of the ships, I'm talking about specific about shipping industry, that is something as any business that going forward that you need to have this uh, you know, as a basic element, which is why we actually start, before this whole initiative, in 2012 we started the SAVER, which stands for C-SPAN's Action for Vessel Energy Reduction Program, which is today, still today, you know, more than 12 years later, it still is the most efficient vessels. So that's just an example. I think that uh, um, as an industry participants, I think we all should do what we can do in the current situation to contribute to the reduction. And I think that's the most practical way. And everybody, you know, have a collaborative approach because this is a whole uh, value chain, a supply chain, which involves the financing, the regulator, the owners, the you know, logistics companies, so everybody to the production the fuel production. So, you know, all the participants has to align and therefore that act collaboratively to contribute to this initiative. Thank you. Laura. Yeah, look, uh, I think, you know, uh, the, the, the three key takeaways that um, uh, we, um, um, we, we heard, you know, from the MEPC-80 uh, was uh, one, you know, the alignment on, on the scope, the will to wake is such a, a significant uh, step forward. Uh, the direction towards the, uh, the net zero bio around uh, 2050 is a very encouraging and, and, and positive uh, step change. And the third one is, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the commitment to work on actually um, uh, the regulatory uh, measure, measures. Uh, so in terms of uh, um, being optimistic or not, I would say it all depends on basically what will happen over the next two years. If we are really serious about deregulation, and basically playing the integrator role, you know, throughout the, the, the value chain, then we can be optimistic on how, you know, with the pace. It will be a bumpy road, no doubt, but this is so critical to basically enable investments, whether it's on the fuel side, on the infrastructure, on the shipyard capacity, preparing for the training of the seafarers, which we, we haven't, you know, brought also to the fore, uh, and, and so many things, mm. uh, including, you know, passing through and financing throughout the, the chain. So, for me, I'll give my answer, you know, on basic, and we'll, we'll, of course, you know, push towards that, but we'll reserve the answer on what will be the outcome of the work over the next two years. So in many ways, you can say that uh, we are optimistic, but yeah. this will be a very decisive decade. The clock is ticking. <laughs> That's a good way to end. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, why don't you give these esteemed industry leaders a big hand?
Thank you very much also from my side. Please stay seated for just two minutes uh, while we get to wrap up uh, this event. It was a very insightful discussion, too short as always, but hopefully you get to stay around uh, also for questions later during our reception. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will have to come to a close now. Uh, a big thank you also to all of you here in the room and to everybody following us online. You've been a fantastic audience, very patient, very kind. Um, What's left to be said, Maritime Forecast is available for download at dnb.com slash Maritime Forecast. In case you're interested to dive a little bit deeper into the findings of our report, we have uh, um, set up an expert webinar that will take place on the 26th of September. Uh, and if you dial in there, you learn a little bit more about the findings, but you would also have the opportunity to ask questions to our experts. Uh, and uh, more on this event can be found on our website. Yeah, sadly, this brings our event to a close. A recording of this session will also be made available very shortly. Uh, and of course, in case uh, you wonder how we in DNV can help you and your companies uh, uh, advance on your decarbonization journey, by all means, reach out to any of us. Uh, we're still around. Uh, for those of you here in this room, you're cordially invited to our drinks reception, which is uh, taking place on the third floor in the Riverside room. So I hope to see many of you there. Unfortunately, that doesn't go for the virtual audience. So to all of you, I just uh, I wish you and your families the very best of health. And I do look forward to seeing you again very, very soon at another DNV event. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.